remember that special someone that you saw and you liked that person and you wondered if they liked you too in the same way? You know that, that handsome guy, that, that gorgeous girl? You had a crush, right? And so when you have a crush, you can't help but wonder, I wonder if that person wants to be with me the way I want to be with them. I want to go out on a date. I want to spend time with them. I want to hang out with them. And so what you do is you begin to, well, I, I mean, you can just be really brave and just ask them out right out. But for the rest of us, you know, we ask friends, hey, do you think so-and-so might like me or something or tell me about so-and-so? And so we go the roundabout way for a while and then you find out they like you. They have a crush on you. Oh, my goodness. It's like the angels are singing so loud, aren't they? It's incredible. It's wonderful. Folks, I've got, a, I've got a word for you. Psalm 23 is God saying to you, I like you. I want to spend time with you. I want to have a special relationship with you. What do you think? Psalm 23 is where we're going to be this morning, and we're going to look at you can live life lacking nothing. You can live life lacking nothing. And I'm going to talk to you about what I mean by that. Not the usual way that a lot of folks on TV may tell you about it, but there is a life that you and I can have. And for me, as we've gone through the last five weeks through David and his story, to me, in a lot of ways, this sermon this morning is the most important because it's the one that we can take it with us and continue in our Christian life, living life this way. So as you look for Psalm 23, I do want to highlight that some of the material I've got for my sermon, I've, I've read it and regurgitated it out to you. It's mine, but I did rely upon Dallas Willard. He has a book called Life Without Lack, and so I've used some of that material, and I've processed it, and I'm going to be sharing that with you, and so it is, yeah, it's coming from me, but I've also want to, it's my footnote. That's what this is, all right? So that's what this is. Let's stand at the reading of God's Word this morning, Psalm 23. I'm reading from the New International Version. If you grew up with the King James, it's going to sound a little different, all right? But follow along with me. It just kind of shows you some of the fluidity of the Hebrew language, all right? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You may be seated. So here's how I want us to, to walk through the sermon this morning. We're going to begin by looking at the life lacking nothing. And when this, I want to talk to you just real quickly. We're going to survey the six verses that are Psalm 23. And so I'm going to give you the life, what it looks like and what that means. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to walk through the next three points is the life lacking nothing. And we're going to look at vision first. What is it? Here's the example. Let's think about what this life is. If I could have a life really lacking nothing, if I have a life with God, what is that really going to look like? And then the next point, life lacking nothing, the intention, all right? This is where, all right, I've seen it, now I want it. That's the next step. Once we see it and understand it, now we've got to move on. Now I want it. I'm going to be intentional about getting this life. And then the next point, living life lacking nothing, what's the means? How am I going to be getting this life? What do I need to be doing and thinking and saying in order to have this life? And then our conclusion, we're going to come back to just, I want to encourage you to step into the life lacking nothing. So let's go back to the first point. Let's run through it here, the life lacking nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. The task of a shepherd is to take care of the sheep. And so that means that I, if Jesus is my Lord, if God is my Lord, if God is my shepherd, I am in the care of someone else. If you say that Jesus is your shepherd, if God is your shepherd, that means that you in your life 
you are in the care of someone else. It also means you're not in charge. It means I'm not in charge, right? So when, when I was growing up, three older brothers, four boys can get into some mischief when mom and dad are gone for the evening, right? Enough said. I don't have to detail you and bore you with details, right? So, yes, you get the picture. So somebody was always left in charge, right? And that meant that they were responsible for us to make sure we didn't burn the house down, all right? That was their job. That meant that, yes, they were to protect us, but that also meant that I have to submit to their leadership. I'm in their charge. They're going to be the ones that are looking out for me, and so they're in charge of my life. And so if you and I, if we've accepted Christ as our Savior, that means then that if we want to be in the with God life, if you will, I want a life that means I'm with God. That's how I want to live this life. And the result from that is that I'm going to lack nothing. What did Jesus say? Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You're not going to be missing something that's vital. You're going to have everything that you need because there will be no lack in your life. You're going to be lacking nothing in this life. So the Lord is my shepherd, and the Lord's going to lead me to lie down in the green pastures and by the still waters. Now, I am not much of a farmer or a shepherd or a herder or a cattle person or livestock at all. I grew up in Houston. I know more about pavement than I do about growing things. I know more about dogs than I do about raising animals you can eat. But one thing I know about sheep, they're a lot like a goat. They'll eat anything. And I mean anything and everything too. You know, if you don't like grass, buy a goat, buy a sheep. They'll eat up all your grass and you'll have a nice yard of dirt, all right? They will eat everything. So when the sheep is lying in the green grass, the sheep is full, can't eat anymore. I'm filled up, can't eat another one. I will explode, right? I would just explode, kind of like Thanksgiving, right? If you eat another bite of turkey, you're just going to be exploding all over the, over the dining room. The water. Jesus said to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling to eternal life. And that's what, that's what our psalm is telling us here. I'm going to have so much. It's going to be such an abundant and wonderful life. It's the eternal life that we want. Restores or refreshes my soul, leads in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Folks, whenever we get our souls get tired, have you ever gotten to that point? It's like, Lord, I've just been beaten on and I'm just so tired. Lord, the Christian life, sometimes it's such a joy and such a wonder. And then there's times that, Lord, I'm just so tired. I just, sometimes, Lord, I'm weak and I pray for a vacation. I want to be a pagan for 24 hours, okay? I'll come right back to the faith at the end of 24 hours. We need our souls restored, and that's what the good shepherd does for us is to restore our souls. Sometimes we're broken and we're hurt deep in our spirit, our souls. God gives us what we need for the restoration of our souls. And then he puts us on that right path, that confident path. When you're driving somewhere, driving somewhere new, and, you know, GPS, right, Isn't GP, GPS makes everything so easy, it never misleads you, does it, right? Never. Oh, no. You know, when you're driving someplace new, especially like if I'm going out of state, we want to we visit our son up in, in, uh, up in New Jersey, you visit their, their condominium that they have, and, you know, I get a little bit nervous. That rattles me. You know, Kathy just buries herself in her work over there riding with me, you know, and I'm sitting here, is this the right road? But when I'm on the right road, I'm at peace. This is the right way. I'm confident about it. And so God puts me on that road. And, and you know what? God is so confident in us that he puts his name on us for his name's sake. God is going to work all of this in our lives, folks, because he's putting his name on us. That's what it means to be Christian, to be Christ-like. I have taken on the name of the Son of God. 
Ah, but that path sometimes goes to the valley of the shadow of death, the dark, the dark times of life, the shadow of death itself, the darkness of death. The right path will go through those valleys, and you and I don't have to have fear. In the most worrisome, most trouble-filled, the scariest times, we don't have to embrace fear. We don't have to have fear. We don't have to have anything in our lives of fear because we're not going to fear anything. A life without fear, especially in the hardest days, isn't that good? And, you know, we, we fear that we're going to run out of money before we run out of the end of the month, right? We fear about relationships. We fear about our children. We fear about our parents. We fear about our jobs. No, none of that is from God. God says, come to me, and through the dark days, you will not be in fear. In fact, what God is going to do is that you are going to be able to soar above the fear. Your faith is going to be beyond fear, and your faith is going to soar. Isn't that that a great way to say faith? I want a faith, God, that soars, that has no issues, no problems, no fears, because, Lord, you are are with me. As a child, my dad, I had a great dad, mom and dad, they're great parents. And you know, when my dad was around, I wasn't afraid of things. Well, okay, if I had done something to violate, you know, his, his rules, okay, I was afraid of dad then. But if we're good, dad and I are good, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid. When I'm walking with God, what do I have to fear? Tell me, list me some things. And when we start to write down something, there's nothing we can write down that we need to be afraid of if we're walking with the Lord. God is with you. Nothing outside of our relationship is going to damage us to the point where we need to be afraid. Now, if I violate God's rules, if I hurt our relationship, now we got some business to do. I need to be afraid of that. But outside of my relationship with Christ Jesus, outside of your relationship with the Lord, there's nothing to fear. And so then we move on to the banquet before our enemies. I I like a banquet. You hungry yet, y'all? Are y'all ready for me to shut up and go eat lunch? I mean, you know, a banquet before my enemies. I've got a banquet that, you know what? I I can feed my enemies. Jesus said for us to do what? That we're to love our enemies, right? And the psalm is teaching us that, yes, there's a way that you can do that. You can love your enemies. And then anoint a head with oil. It's not just God's going to be blessing to us, and the blessing is overflowing. You see the cup? The cup overflows. It's not a life that we have to live. You know what? It's, you just need the bare necessities, and that's it, okay? You can't have any frills. You can't have dessert ever. That's not the Christian life. This is, this is telling us what? It's okay to have the extras. It's okay to have the blessings. It's okay to have something special. Goodness and mercy, loving kindness, the word has said in Hebrew, will follow me. It can also be translated as pursue. I like to say it that way. Surely goodness and mercy, it's going to pursue me. It's it's not just follow, all right? I mean, somebody's following you, there's, what's special about that, you know? And sometimes it's like you worry about it. Were they still behind us, you know? Did I lose them on the last turn? No, I like the translation of pursue, almost to the point of stalking, but it's a good stalking, all right, because it's from God. God is ready to pounce upon you with goodness and grace and his loving kindness. That's what God wants to do. And then you're going to want to, what? Dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It could also be translated return. It's the usual word for return. And so it's not like come back to church every week. No, I want to come and be in God's house. I want to live with God and I want to stay and I want to dwell and I want to linger. Folks, after church, after we have our our last prayer, the last blessing that Stephanie gives, I'll be standing back over there in the corner. And you know what Kathy and I love to do? Of course, we love to greet you, but we also like to watch you as you gather together 
and talk with one another. It's called, there's an actual phrase for it. It's called linger time. It's after church. What's the linger time? And the linger time, the longer the linger time, the healthier the church usually is. If we have guests this morning, hang around. Watch the, you can step back there and watch with us, all right? But you linger. You want to be with one another, and we want to be with the Lord. We just want to hang out for a little bit. And so that's why I, I don't turn the lights out. I don't try to run you out of here. I like the linger time. It's good. It's healthy for us to live that way. Folks, in this right here, the good news, the gospel, this is how we realize the gospel in our lives, that I am with God, and thus I have to be anxious for nothing. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. I am I'm anxious about nothing. Isn't this, folks, the life that you crave? Isn't this really the life that you want? Isn't it life that you desire? I mean, how could you know of the grace of God and not want it? And so let's move to our next point. Let's start looking at the V-I-M. I, I, I don't know Latin. That's one, of the, that's one of the languages I've not studied, but I think the word means it's direction. So how are we going to get there? We're going to start with the vision, all right? Life, living life lacking nothing. The intention. What is, what's the goal? What are we going to put before us? Right is right here. And so the life living with uh, lacking nothing is rooted in the knowledge of God. I've got to know God. Have you ever met somebody and you liked them until you got to know them? <laughs> then you didn't like them so much, right? Folks, you've got to know God to want to be with him. And you've got to know him in the right way. You've got to know him for who he is and what he does and not in some other way. Your, con your primary contact with God is through your mind, what we think about God. When I pray, Lord, I'm praying to you. Lord, I'm listening to you. And I've said before, you know, I've never heard God speak to me in an audible voice. I think sometimes it's gotten close, but never in an audible voice. I'm not, maybe you have. I'm not saying that can't happen. But usually it's in the mind. And so my mind needs to be in tune rightly with God. So I've got to drink in scriptures. I've got to drink in times with him in prayer. And folks, what you do with your mind is the most important choice that you make because that controls your whole life right there. Life without lacking. God has to be in our lives. And that's the vision I think that we have. He's the source of life. And salvation is more than just my sins are forgiven and one day I get to go to heaven. It's got to be more than that. Living on this earth has to be more important than just passing time until we get to be with Jesus in glory. We want to be with God and think of him in the right way that matches who he is. So then we have the intention. So there's the vision. I want to be with God. And who doesn't? Who knows Christ? So the intention is now, now it's the goal. Now I've got to want to go do it. I can't tell you how many times I have shared a plan of salvation with somebody and they said, you know what, that sounds good. I said, do you want this? Well, you know, not right now. Not right now. They've seen the vision, but they don't have the intention there. They don't want Christ in their lives. Yeah, I've got the knowledge of God. I don't want him right now in my life. And you can, there's just millions of reasons why that they can come up with. Folks, life without lack, our mind, I've got to want it. And so don't just see it there. Don't just have the knowledge, but want it. Put it on your, put it on, it's number one on your bucket list, really. I've got to have this before I go to Tahiti, all right? This is the number one thing. And we see life, people living life with lack, the lack of kindness, the lack of fairness, of compassion. There's so much wrong in our world with injustice and oppression, natural disasters as well, broken relationships, selfishness, pride, and even apathy. And in all of this, even though it's not in our psalm, don't forget that the devil is out there too. What does Satan want to do? What's the number one goal of Satan? Satan wants to steal and to kill and to destroy, and the Satan wants to steal and kill and destroy this type of life that you can have. If we've accepted Christ as our Savior and know him as Lord, then our salvation is secure. So what can Satan take away from us? He can take away the with God life from us. 
by giving us a lot of even good things to do, but we are doing them without God. And so we're missing everything. Folks, when God looks at us, he's not just looking at our actions or even primarily what we're thinking and doing, but he's looking really at what we're thinking, with what we're doing with our minds, our hearts, and our intentions. We're so worried about actions, and God is pouring himself, his attention upon what we're thinking in our minds. What did, what did, why did God want David? It's because he's a guy that does the right things? No. <laughs> we saw that last week, right? That was quite entertaining as I had to tame that story down to make it PG-13. David and Bathsheba. <laughs> no, God knows us, knows David as a man after his own heart. He looked at his mind, at his soul, at his spirit, at who he was. Folks, who would not want this life? Set that as your intention. And then four, the means. How are we going to do it now? Here's, here's where the rubber meets the road, the water hits the wheel as they say, how are we going to live this way? You live out your faith, you live self-denial, and you live love. That is the three ways. All right, we live out the faith. Folks, we have a good faith. Christianity is a solid faith. Now, is it a compelling faith? When somebody hears about Christ and the salvation, is it like, wow, I'm overwhelmed, I can't do anything except embrace the faith? No, but it is a reasonable faith. It's not irrational. Christianity is not, a, the faith of Christianity, it's not a leap in the dark, folks. There is faith and you have to step out, but it is rational. And I'm going to throw an advertisement in right now. Next week, Eric Hernandez from Texas Baptist will be preaching here. Eric is the one that's overseeing our unapologetic conference that's coming in September. He's going to get us fired up about the conference. Apologetics is a defense of our faith. And really, you know what? I think it does more to bless us as believers. It doesn't really convince unbelievers, but it helps us to go out and talk to unbelievers. It encourages us. And we see that the faith is rational. Young folks, our youth, I encourage you to come. All right, you come and you see how the faith is rational when it is lived out. So, yes, we're to live out our faith. And advertisers know about living out our faith. Advertisers will try to hire a celebrity, somebody that you like, right? And they're try they, they want you to put your faith in that person and what they're advertising so you'll buy their widgets, right, whatever they're selling. Oh, well, I'm going to buy that because so-and-so says to buy it. I like so-and-so. That's what faith is. Also, Paul says it this way. Faith, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ Jesus. That's Romans 10, 17. So we live out our faith. Living by faith, just it doesn't always mean I've got to step out into nowhere. Living the faith means I'm going to follow after Jesus. I'm going to live the faith by living a moral and ethical life. Living the faith means I'm going to do what I need to be doing as well as holding to the doctrines of our faith. And then I'm going to have a, faith, a life of self-denial. I'm going to be able to deny myself as we follow Jesus. Why do we engage in destructive behavior? Why do we see individuals commit horrific sins and crimes all around our country? It is because they feel so cooped up and eventually it erupts that they have to have their own way and they do it in the most expressive way possible. And folks, you and I have an answer for that. It is self-denial. This world isn't about me. It's not about you. It's about the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, and following after him and looking to him in all that I do. Parents, we worry about our children. This is one of the biggest fears that we have. And it's not even so much about their safety, although when your child begins to learn how to drive, that's a pretty fearful occasion, all right? You're afraid of other people out there as well as your child, okay? But the biggest fear is what? It's the faith. Will they hold on to the faith? And parents, we need to take our hands 
off of our kids. And we need to let God do his wonder because it's not about us. And when we want to hang on to our kids, that's about us. I've got to trust God that you're the shepherd to lead my life. And I'm still going to pray for my kids and love my kids and try to help lead them to stay faithful to you. But, Lord, it's about you being my shepherd, about you being in charge, and not me trying to take over charge of one little area of reality in my life. I'm going to trust you in that. And then love. Folks, the hallmark of a life lacking nothing is serving others. It's not about getting a big bank account. It's not having to worry about health insurance because you're going to always be healthy. It's about serving others because you love other people. I don't have to worry about somebody getting ahead of me because I want them to get ahead of me. I love them. And I want what is best for them. In fact, I don't even just want what's best for them. I want what's best for them and then some. I want their cups to overflow. That's what I want in their lives. Nothing greater in life than to be called a servant. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 23. So, folks, what's the step? Here's the next step. Folks, you, you can't drift into this life. You can't drift into this life. You have to be intentional about it. Folks, you can't drift into this life any more than you can drift into marriage. I, I, I walked in the conversation, somebody today, a couple of guys, one of them's early in college, and, and I, I caught the conversation wrong, but I ran with it because it was funny. Here it is. I, I, he's about 20. I said, so I just heard you've been married eight years. Is that right? <laughs> Do the math, folks, right? I've been married eight years. You've been married eight years? Yeah. I said, and his dad walks in at that time. I said, hey, did you know he's been married for eight years? He said, no, I didn't know that at all. And then I looked at him and I said, you didn't even know it yourself. No, I didn't, you know. Are you married? Yeah, I just got accidentally married. I guess I just drifted into it, right, you know. Folks, that never happens. You have a choice. Do you, right? You can say yes or no. We know some folks that should have said no, right? Yeah. <laughs> no confessions now, okay, no confessions. Folks, we don't drift into this life with God. We have to be intentional about it. And I pray that you will want to be intentional about it. And I pray that if you're not sure or that sounds okay, I pray that you will ask God to give you the desire for this life that you will pursue it without end, that you will stalk God. God, I'm going to come after you until you give me this life that David wrote about in Psalm 23. That's what I want. That's how I want to live. I'll end with this quote from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a Baptist preacher in England from the 1800s. He said, quote, We have things and abound, not because I have a good store of money in the bank, not because I have skill and wit with which to win my bread, but because the Lord is my shepherd, end quote. Folks, this life begins by knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's one thing to know that Christ died on the cross for your sins, but that is not enough because Satan knows that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and it hasn't done him a bit of good. We have to look at the cross and say, you know what? I should have been there instead. That should be my punishment. That should be the other people's punishment around me who have wronged me, that they should get the punishment. But Jesus took all the punishment of our sin. And Jesus offers us life. Doesn't force it upon us, offers it to us. Will you receive Christ as your Savior? Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's a choice. Will you choose Jesus this day? We're going to stand in just a moment, not yet, but in a moment. We're going to stand and I want to pray over you. I'm going to pray for you about your salvation. I want you to pray about your salvation. And if you know Christ as your Savior, then what life, what is your Christian life? How would you describe it? What's it like? Is it like what David says in Psalm 23 as I've shared with you? Or is it something else? God is saying, here's the life I have for you. Receive it. 
Some of you are looking for a church home. I encourage you to come and join us here. This is the time to come forward. You come forward, pray with me or pray with one of the other staff members. You come forward and say, hey, I've got church membership over here. I want you to transfer the letter here. All right, we can do that. We'll, we'll tell them, take you off the roll over there. We'll put you here. Some of you need to be baptized. You accept Christ as your Savior. Maybe, maybe it's not been believer's baptism. That's what we want. We want you to be baptized by immersion after you believe and not before. Or perhaps you've already done all of that, but you don't have church membership somewhere, okay? Maybe you got baptized at the beach or somewhere else. You come by your statement of faith in Christ and that you have already been baptized by immersion. That's how you come and join. We invite you to join us this morning. Some of you, maybe God has put a call upon your life to be an under-shepherd, under his shepherding, and you are to shepherd others. We want to hear about that. Come forward and to tell a church about that. We want to pray for you. What's your decision, folks? This morning... This day, this service, this passage, you have to make a decision about it, yes or no. And to put off a decision is no, I don't want it. Let it be yes. Let's stand for that word of prayer right now. Lord God, fill our minds, our thoughts with the verses of Psalm 23. And that psalm in six verses conveys so many aspects of a life lived for you. And that each of us can identify with a verse or a phrase in a verse. Bring those phrases to our minds now. And let the life that those phrases and words point to, let it tantalize our minds to the point where we say, Lord, I want that life. Lord, as believers, may we reach out to embrace it and put in place in our lives what we need in our lives to experience that life. And Lord, to have your guidance and to helping us remove the things out of our lives we do not need. And for those who don't know you, Lord Jesus, put your call upon them for salvation. Today is the day that that life begins. Bring them forward right now. For your glory, in Jesus' name I pray, amen.